following is a Journey into Comics Network production. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's the Podfather Nate here. This is the Journey into Comics Network Best of the Week show. Highlights from all of the shows that have released this week on our network for you to get a taste of everything that we've got going on. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Journey into Comics. So I'm sitting here looking at a rundown, and Messenger works in such a way that I was like, I was like scrolling. I'm like, okay, we're gonna talk about this, and then I just thumbs down the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, we're not talking about. It. All right, so the whole thing with, uh, um, you were talking about Disney buying Fox, yeah, and uh, I've heard that the deal is completely off the table right now. Uh, talks have officially stopped. However. Like, cause, because Disney was looking at buying the whole film division as as a complete. Like, the only things that they wouldn't buy would be news and sports. Well, uh, the reason is just beyond Marvel, though. If they buy 20th Century Fox, do you know what Disney officially also has the rights to? It'll be A New Hope. A New Hope. And that's one of the reasons we've never got a original re-release of the, f- of the first three films. Because, technically speaking, Disney... And Star Wars and Lucas Films don't own the rights to A New Hope, so they can't do that. They can do the. That's why. Okay, 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 okay. okay. I think we were talking about this. We we're talking about this somewhere here, or we were. I don't remember what we were doing. What episode it was? We we're talking about how musicians will go and they'll remaster their works and add a little bit to make it their own. And that's kind of what I think George might have done when he was doing the uh, extended editions and the uh, altering special Special. editions, thank you, from the 90s. Is like, well, I don't have ownership to A New Hope. Here's an excuse to do it. Might as well just do all three movies, make people less wondering why we're doing that. Now I have some rights to A New Hope. It's not the original. Uh, So if that happens, that's huge. Then if the thing with Marvel happens, that's huge. I mean, there are a lot of opportunities right now. If this happens, Deadpool. Deadpool will be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe if this cell happens. All right. So from what I understand that the overall arcing acquisition of Disney and Fox is now talks have been completely stopped. However, the what what is still on the possibly on the table, they haven't started it yet, is the acquisition of assets uh, and, and of IP. So therefore, you could get your a new hope things that Marvel or Disney has interest in for their other things like the X-Men, the Deadpool stuff, the Marvel stuff. Um, and it's interesting because I kind of thought that this would come from, from Sony before it would come from, <laughs> come from Fox. Well, but Fox is, uh, I think they're in more troubled waters than they're willing to admit maybe. And I just feel like, you know, with, Disney and Sony is very similar. There were talks. The talks went away. They're all off the table. Nothing's happening. Boom. Announcement that Spider-Man's coming back home. Like, it was literally that quick. It was like within a month and a half, it was like there were talks, there's no talks, and it's done. So could the no talks thing be to quell rumors so they can actually get work done, decide between the two parties what's going to be best, if it's going to be a cooperative deal like Sony has where they're going to use all the IP and then it's going to be published or released by 20th Century. Or are they just going to outright buy that part of the company and go, go ahead and do your news and shit, Fox News. We'll have this cool part. Maybe they won't keep it 20th Century Fox. Maybe they will. I don't know how Disney's going to want to choose to do that. Um, <clears throat> but the opportunity to literally at that point, you would have one superhero who's not fully fully owned by Marvel, which would be Spidey, technically speaking, it changes everything yet again, and it's like, oh, look, Phase 3 is about to be done, and what's going to happen in Phase 4 of Marvel? Oh, look, now all of a sudden, all these new characters that we couldn't touch are able to be touched that are old characters that they can do true love letters to. I mean, imagine a Marvel-envisioned Fantastic Four or X-Men, and you know Marvel, they'll be dope as hell, and they have high praise on how Ryan Reynolds did. They're not going to recast Ryan Reynolds out of Deadpool. That is going to be one thing I guarantee you will not happen. Ryan Reynolds will be Deadpool until he doesn't want to be Deadpool anymore. Uh, just because he's such he's such a he just does the he is Wade Wilson. I mean, it's like he's the perfect he is 
Deadpool, I guess, is the way I'm trying to say that. But I don't know, man. This is, um, we're, we're in that weird world of all this news of churning and change. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of this sale? Is there is there anything that sparks your interest if this does happen? Pretty much everything that's already been said. I I don't know what else they could really want. I know 20th Century Fox has their hands on a lot of different things, but I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what they all were, and uh, like until you put them out in front of me. I know that like it almost seems like Disney's setting up a big uh, an even bigger monopoly than what they already have. Well, danger. Um, I did you hear about? Is it? AT&T or Time Warner, somebody trying to buy mm-hmm. something. They want to buy CNN, but they got to – or they want to buy something. They want to buy – AT&T wants to buy Time Warner, but they have to sell T, uh, CNN in order to do CNN. so. Yeah. So I wonder – that, that whole thing is another political – I mean, that, I mean that's a talk for the poor report. Yeah, that's we'll a, save that. We don't that – is <laughs> That is a whole big political talk there where I'm not really too sure where the lines are crossing. But, uh, you know, we're going to go switch gears here. And we are going to talk about you. Okay, so there was a big switch over, on, like on the on, like on the comic book uh, world here, and um, and of course, uh, Brian Michael Bendis. Um. So, you want to talk about him switching sides? Yeah. And of course, uh, he was a uh, long time. Um, was he a writer? He was a cornerstone of the modern Marvel movement for the past 15 years. Brian Michael Bendis has done countless stories and helped edit and helped, you know, create and and was a voice of reason and someone that a lot of people in Marvel looked up to. And it's one of those things. Brian Michael Bendis, when he got his first break, it was with Marvel. He was a loyalist. He did a lot of amazing things. I mean, Brian Michael Bendis's name is on some of the best modern era Marvel stories. If you look at his tenure in Marvel and just go down the line, it's super impressive. But it's awesome that in this day and age, his career was not stifled and he was not like, well, I have to stay loyal to Marvel. That's it. He did what I think I would do, and he was given an opportunity. He's made a name for himself. So DC says, hey, we want to offer you a contract for you to come right for us. I love this move. I don't know what it's going to bring, but I feel like DC's comic world is about to get like amped up to the next level. Jeff Johns and Brian Michael Bendis collaborating together to make stories. Holy shit. It's going to be insane. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, of course, there were reactions. You know, Scott Snyder saying, get, you know, getting to work alongside Brian, uh, Brian Bendis is... Uh, Yet another comic dream realized this year. Brian, you're going to slay. Cannot wait. So, I mean, it is big news when you have somebody who is a, uh, I mean, Ed, that's like in like in the movie realm that you know that's as big as uh, as um, brain fart. What the heck, a dude coming over to help out with Justice League? Um, oh, 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 Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon, wow, yeah, early morning brain fart. Well, Joss Whedon, of course, you know, uh, pretty much, in like like on the film, helped get the Avengers, uh, you know, you know that that team up movie, and then of course, like when they helped get the, all that stuff off the ground and and get the like their style established. And now he's coming over. And he had to help finish up Justice League, and of course, he's doing Batgirl at some point. But Nate, um. Dude, oh, oh, I, I want to talk about Justice League 2 before we get off here today. Sure. Um, um, one thing I want to add real quick, last thing to the Bendis thing here, and then we can move on. Uh, he created two very important characters in the Marvel world, uh, one of which is a gigantic fan favorite, one of which has actually had their own Netflix series already. So that's how important Brian Michael Bendis was to Marvel. He created Miles Morales. He wrote Ultimate Spider-Man for the longest. He also created Jessica Jones which I did not know until I just read. So this this is pretty this cool. is a huge change. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes in the future. Of course, here in a week or so, I think we've got Doomsday Clock coming up uh, in the... We have Punisher series. DC Punisher series on Netflix. We have Justice League movie. Holy shit. We're just coming off of Thor. 
um, Ragnarok. So, the, first of all, before we get to Justice League, the new Punisher series uh, is coming out this Friday as you're hearing this. And so, not the next episode, but an episode after that, we should have something to say about it. We're going to watch some of that, if not all of it. It's like a 13 episode series, or you know, you know, like season. Hopefully, should be able to dive through that pretty quickly. Um, now, originally, I found this out about that, buddy. You know the the uh, New York Comic Con mm-hmm. cancellation. They were going to uh, come out and have make a big news deal about it. Did you hear about no. this? No. So I watched an interview with uh, uh, Jim Norton and uh, Sam Roberts, over, over, like over on Sirius, and they interviewed John Bernthal, and they asked like, how did he feel about you know the cancellation of the Comic Con thing? He, and, and he said that was my idea. I didn't want to do it. He goes, it, like, it wasn't right. He goes, we were going to do this big story where I came out and said, you know, uh, so check it out. You know, we're doing this new Punisher thing, and it's available right now. Holy shit. They were going to do the release date as of that day. You can get it on Netflix right now. Go get it. Holy shit. And uh, they were going to make this big news thing about it. And he goes, and it didn't feel right. He goes, he goes, I mean, yeah, you could talk about the content and how it's more violent and then the whole little gut thing. And, and, and he goes... Goes, but really, he goes. We didn't want to try to like take away from the big news story of that, or you know, we or like with, with all with all the, with all the tragedy of that going on, us making a big noise over here saying like big media event, you know, this new ultraviolet TV show coming out right now. Uh, and then of course, uh, <laughs> and then of course, he said uh, he goes he goes. So we decided to wait and just bide our time, and then we'll do it. And then uh, about a week before they're going to launch the series, they had another. Um, tragedy uh, down in Texas with the shooting down there and like in the church. He goes, it's not, so if it's not one thing, it's another. I, I've heard some pretty good things about the series. He, uh, you know, John's pretty excited about it. He was phenomenal as Frank but, Castle. It's going to be great. I cannot at all wait. It's weird. I feel like I abandoned the Defenders as soon as I knew that Netflix and Disney are kind of slowly severing ties because the Disney streaming service. All right, so... As far as that goes, as far as the Disney and Netflix deal, no new shows will be created for Netflix. The shows that are currently going will still be in production for as long as they go. Oh, wow. That's actually interesting. That is, that is, that is what I have uh, what I've understand. They're not just going to move stuff over, um, but any new Marvel uh, television stuff is going to go to the Disney streaming app. Because I guess Marvel and Netflix made this deal themselves. And then uh, Disney up here now they're they get that now I'm pretty sure they can override and they can say no more no more no more, but I'm pretty sure that they see that these that this stuff is successful, and this stuff is just going to be like hey you know this that Marvel stuff on Netflix, come over to come over to Disney because you can their plan is to make the Disney streaming app cheaper than Netflix so that way you, you can have it as an additive service, uh so you pay for your Netflix he goes and then you got your Disney app, and so I can see that being like five bucks. A month instead of like the ten or thirteen that like that 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 Netflix is now, so they want that to be, uh, you know, supplementary. But uh, okay, dude, uh, I I got off track and I tangent. Sure, you. that's so ju- that's journey into comics the, for you. The journey, journey, the the Justice League uh, has been uh, has been premiered to the press. They can't print anything yet, but they were allowed to share their thoughts. On Twitter, have you read any of these? some of them? Uh, from what I'm gathering, and I'm gonna let, I'm sure you probably have some pulled up. You'll read more elaborately. I don't have any pulled up. I just have it for. Oh, memory. okay. Uh, from what I remember from reading it, one of them essentially said that the movie is really sloppy. It's kind of a mess. The character development is great. The characters are really well done. The story maybe suffers. You know, I don't know if you know this, but Warner Brothers told DC. Justice League, you have to keep it under two hours, no matter what. And I feel like they shot a fucking four-hour movie and cut two hours from what the way these reviews are saying that there's some stuff that's not <clears throat> it's the BVS thing all over again. Important stuff relegated to one line that you might miss in the moment because stuff has been cut. But the thing that's most important, in my opinion, from this is that the characters themselves are established. If the story is not perfect, that's fine. Let the characters be, oh, my God, I love seeing that team together. Well, you know, And we've said before, or at least I've said it, 
that the first Avengers movie, the story is fucking thin. Yes. It's not a very good story. The only interesting thing is for me about the first Avengers is that you had Loki, who was an interesting character. Yep. And but he's not a big, this big bad. So and I've heard Steppenwolf is kind of like a lackluster character, and I've heard that uh, that Cyborg is as well. But your Aquaman and your Flash really still the show here, and which is what I was expecting. As as long as Ben could still you know be the Batman that he was, and then you got Wonder Woman doing her thing, and of course we turn to Superman. I think I'm going to be pretty happy with this because it's already coming out with a better reaction to, than BVS. Absolutely. Did. You know, so if they can just make it better than that, I think it's going to be a good time at, 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 at the theater. And who knows, maybe I might even, uh, you know, you know, pull a Westicles and maybe like it as much as he liked BVS. I mean, he called that movie like a five-star movie. Dude, he, he was like nine, ten out of ten. It was like... He really loved it. He that was movie. down on his knees praising to all that is Batman v Superman. You thought I was going somewhere else, you dirty ass. But <laughs> no. Uh Justice League is gonna be exciting. We've actually got some cool stuff planned. That's gonna be probably a part of our one seventy or one sixty seven episode of JIC, unless we do like a Patreon exclusive to review it only on Patreon. I don't know how we're gonna do that. I guess it's just gonna depend on how that goes, because Brando this weekend, fucking six days from this week, from right now, I'll be in your neck of the woods with the rest of the crew, and you'll be with the crew, and we're going to gather and go watch Justice League, and there's no podcasting. None. None. Zero. Zilcherino. Zilcherino. Yeah, dude, we're going to hang out and have a good time, uh, you know, Normally, when we get together, we like to podcast our butts off, but we need to actually just spend time as people and as friends and not as co-hosts. Yeah, get to hang out and actually enjoy each other's company. This is what we call, Brando, I feel like the Justice League event that we're putting together to have all of us together. First of all, it's cool because, again, it's like the Justice League. We're all meeting up together to do this thing. But then also, it's like great team building. I feel like when we had the first supper and that whole thing, the network kind of grew together more. And I want to just keep fostering that bigger and bigger and bigger. Not necessarily to say more and more people, but I just want the inner sanctum of the network to be so close knit to each other. And I think we're I think right. we're doing a great job of of developing that. Because listen, it's hard. Half of you guys are in one place, the rest of the crew is in another place. And uh, it's nice when we can all gather and spend some time and just dork out. The last time I think we just got to hang out was like, what, Memorial Day weekend? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Poor Rapport. I am your host, Andrew Poor, and I want to thank you for joining me. Boycotting an item. If this comes to, like, maybe a sports jersey, if... Uh, the most recent I remember is when uh, LeBron James left Cleveland for Miami, and a ton of his fans from Cleveland would were burning their jerseys. The point of that is, oh yeah, you're upset, but you're not affecting any business by doing this. You paid for the jersey, you paid for the item, you're destroying it is something you can do because you paid for it. They still have your money regardless. So the whole thing with this boycott Keurig, yes, that may means you're not going to be a return customer, but with this business, they have your $100 or more that you paid for that Keurig coffee maker. And if you throw it, break it and everything... They still had that money you paid initially. Sure, they're probably going to notice the trickle-down effect that maybe a year from now when people typically upgrade their Keurig device or replace it if it gets old, maybe they don't see that return business. But with this day and age when there's so much information coming in, these boycotts and these uh, protests and everything, they fluctuate. There's an ebb and flow to it. So it might seem like the most necessary thing right now, but six months from now, this might be completely over and people are going to go out and buy their Keurig again because it's a good deal or they need a coffee maker. 
So that's kind of my thoughts on it, is that there's no sense to... Like, I remember hearing about people who were going out and buying Harry Potter books and movies and then immediately burning them, which seems counterproductive because you're giving the people you dislike your money to then go and destroy it, which just means you don't have that item. They still count it as someone bought an item, which only helps their bottom line. That's like saying, like, if I sell someone a glass vase for $10, and they immediately take that vase and then throw it against the wall and shatter it and go, ha, and I go, well, okay, that's fine. I still have your $10, so I still got what I wanted out of it. You just don't have what you paid for. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. I'm sure there'll be an issue, but I remember even when there was the whole uh, Chick-fil-A incident with... uh, they came out with their stance. I think I believe it was against like the LGBTQ community, and there was a big uh, boycott uh, Chick Fil A. And I haven't heard anything about that since then. So it was definitely a very short incident, and I don't even hear about it anymore. I didn't really think on that this morning when I was kind of prepping the show about what these kind of things that people are talking about. And it's just another one of those crazy things. And this is a recent thing, as I think. Uh, over the weekend, like late weekend, that uh, this whole incident came about. And there's so many people defending the actions of Romer, kind of circling back to the origins of this story, but will immediately condemn a celebrity for a similar action, which is almost like a double standard. Like, if it's someone I already support, it's more easy to believe that it's wrong, or it's something that I can ignore, but if it's someone I already dislike, like, it's a lot of, almost, it's becoming a political issue in an extent, like, oh, this person's a Republican, maybe it's not as bad as it thinks it is, versus, oh, this is the Hollywood elite, these are these high-level liberals that are finally getting their just desserts from that position, and they deserve what's coming to them. And it's just, it, we're also in a world where allegations equal truth, and I'm sure it's kind of how it is at this point that these events, a lot of these instances that have been coming out, I'm sure the majority of them are true, but there's probably some that are false that are, that are going to take away from the cause of some of these that are true and should be dealt with. And I honestly believe that if, if all these allegations are true, they deserve everything that's coming to them. And one of the recent ones that hit kind of close to home beyond the whole Kevin Spacey thing which I kind of, I guess I'll go into that now. Um, so since I think my last two episodes is where I kind of talked about the whole Kevin Spacey thing in the past couple of weeks, Kevin Spacey's career has plummeted to below rock bottom. He's lost out on movies, uh, planned awards. He got officially fired from his show. Like they're no longer going to produce house of cards with involving Kevin Spacey. The last reports I've read is that they've, uh, scrapped the script I don't know how many weeks in the production they were, but they're just going to not use that and are going to try and find a different direction to go with season six, dealing with his character's absence, if it meant recasting, just to finish off his story, if it meant uh, killing him off screen, saying that between the hiatus, for those of you who guys watched up through season five, his post-presidential life, dealing with President Claire Underwood, maybe... Uh, getting murdered in there, maybe something that Claire orchestrated, or if it's going to be just ignoring the fact that he existed and just continuing Claire's arc to end the series. And all the reports I've read is that the the writer's room and the showrunners are currently trying to figure out a way to close the arc without Kevin Spacey's character, which is kind of hard since he was the central figure of the show. Now, the show is based on a British show of the same name, and I believe the last season of that and the last book, he had been assassinated or killed in some manner and they continued with her playing like the lady Macbeth type role finishing off the run so they're probably trying to adapt more from that and hopefully we still get a good product I'm still a big fan of the show it kind of it really does suck that this had to happen but based on all the allegations came out Kevin Space deserves to have his career completely affected by all this and we're going to kind of see how further his legacy is saying we've seen they've already pulled him from that Ridley Scott movie where he played J. Paul Getty and are going to replace him with Christopher Plummer 
and that movie's still going to release next month, which is kind of crazy. A movie that was done, trailered, going to be released, or just they're just going to remove Kevin Spacey's character and all that filming he did completely from the movie and redo it right now as we're talking and then get it back up. I guess he only recorded for two weeks. So it's not a lot of scenes he has to worry about, but it's still kind of a monumental event that a movie that essentially can be finished can lead can be just cut out and replaced to still save the work that everyone else did and prevent it from being tainted by what happened. Now, another thing that really hit close to home was over the weekend it was announced that there were sexual assault allegations against Andrew Kreisberger on the CW Arrow shows, I believe all four of them. And kind of first I'm like, oh, that just sucks. I remember sharing it to the network page and everyone else was kind of upset that people actually watched those shows. And it kind of led to that on uh, yesterday morning at the time of uh, you're listening to this, um, a lot of the Arrowverse female stars came out with statements of support of women's rights and understanding that, which kind of leads me to believe that there's a lot of truth to these allegations and we're going to kind of see how uh, these Arrowverse, Arrowverse shows move forward without one of their main executive producers who helped create a lot of these shows years ago. So we're not going to keep up with the story as it develops and we'll see if he's officially suspended, if he never comes back to the show, if there's anything that he was involved with that has to lead to that. But it, don't see these shows going where the, a lot of these shows are very much about women's empowerment and women's rights and this show the shows will stand without him and they will stand against him and i wouldn't be surprised if we see their own uh narrative story kind of involving this type of situation in one of the condos i wouldn't be surprised if supergirl did an episode re- involving uh a high level person and some less than desirable attention to kara or someone else within her world so we'll kind of have to see how this story plays out, but I'll definitely be keeping up with this because th- those shows are very important to me and I wouldn't want any of them affected by this stuff. And I guess kind of moving forward, uh, over the past weekend I got to have uh, kind of some fun. I was I had flown back uh, uh, during the week, so I was able to kind of enjoy the weekend for once. I'm not I'm traveling to Colorado. I still go back. Actually, I'll be back in Colorado by the time you listen to this recording, so... That's kind of uh, how it is here. But um, one thing I got to do, which I always enjoy doing, is I got to visit uh, used books or do some Christmas shopping and some shopping for myself. And I was able to go to my local family video and rent a few movies. And I really encourage my listeners to really go out and support your local used bookstore or a local chain of uh, used bookstores. Like I, I don't have too many used bookstores around me, but I go to Half Price Books, which... It's kind of in the Midwest and kind of around everywhere, which is essentially, a, it's just a, a chain of used bookstores, and they always get money, and they had a, a coupon weekend, so I went and got um, a couple books, like the Brian Cranston biography, as well as the Blu-ray trilogy of The Dark Knight, so I got The Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, so I'm pretty happy with that investment, because I've been slowly trying to upgrade my movie collection uh, from some of the ones I really like, from DVDs to Blu-rays, but I have hundreds and hundreds of movies so it's a very slow process and you can't really just drop that kind of money because I need it with two copies so as I increase one to blu-ray I try and sell off my dvds for to recoup some of that cost difference end up with a better quality film to kind of go forward and I'm sure by the time I get my whole collection of blu-ray there'll be whatever's next that I'll have to deal with but it's a slow process but I'm happy and I was able to rent a few uh, movies, including a, and a movie I got to see on the plane on my trip back that I kind of want to discuss now. So, on my flight back, it was a late flight, and you typically they don't let you, you have to basically pay for the movie you watch, but because we had the de-icing issue and all that stuff, they were able to watch it for free. So I was able to watch War of the Planet of the Apes, which was a great movie, and it kind of closed out the trilogy that was uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Do I have everybody's attention now? Brock Lesnar and Mr. Perfect. 
got into a wrestling match on the plane. Holy shit. And bumped into the emergency exit door. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we won't go into that here. That's a whole breakdown we'll save of it. events. Um, needless to say, Scott Hall got fired, uh, but it wasn't because of the plane. He fell asleep backstage at a show. <laughs> He's getting old, man. I sympathize with that way more now that I've hit 30 and sometimes I'm watching a TV show and the next thing I know the show is over and I have taken a 35-minute power nap. Dude, I sympathize with that shit. Me too. <laughs> I hit 30 and it's like, I, dude, I, 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 do, I do this a lot. I'm like, dude, tonight, no podcasts, no kid. I'm staying up and I'm playing me a game. Put some time into this damn thing. And I get to, a, like, 9 o'clock, and I'm ready to go to bed. And I'm like, should I? Can I do it? And I might even convince myself to stay up to, like, 11. But once I'm at 11, dude, I'm like, I'm going to bed. Zombie mode, <laughs> legit. Dude, I don't have it anymore. I'm tapped, dude. Tap out. I'm old. I feel you. I, I totally I do. I no longer, you know, when I was on nights, dude, I, 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 before I went to nights, I was a night owl. Where even on, like, work nights, I'd stay up late. And then uh, get up early in the morning, go. And then I go to nights, and then I, do, I mean, I'm up. I'd be up until eight o'clock in the morning because, like, then I would go to sleep, and I get up in the afternoon and go to work. And then I switched and came to days, and I never really capt recaptured that. I think I was 29, so I guess really like when I went back to days, and I was 29, and then the, and, you know, and then I hit 30. But it's. I, if we're going to eat dinner and watch a show, right, and it's 9 o'clock, we are not watching anything that I need to pay attention to. Yeah, because you're liable to doze. Well, here's, no, here's the thing. I gotta, One, i got to go to bed. So I want something that I can dip out of and just say, good night, I'm going to bed. Number two, I don't want something that I need to pay attention to because it keeps me awake. Yep. Number three, if I want to watch something that I want to pay attention to, um, leading up, I'm probably going to fall asleep. <laughs> that's one. Re that's another reason why you, all of you, 24, 25, 26 episode season shows can suck my ass because <laughs> I cannot watch you. I will not watch you. It is physically impossible for me <laughs> to watch all your episodes, especially your Villain of the Week episodes where you spend... 40 minutes of the show doing jack all, making this one character that had a run. He's an E list villain in some book that wasn't even the, that character's book. It was another character that you said brought him over because they're all DC, whatever. And then the last five minutes of the show, they're like, dun, 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 next week on Arrow. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't have to watch this freaking episode at all. I don't know if that's true. I think I can genuinely say this deep into my obsession of the CW shows, and we'll get into this maybe on Journey into Comics because we have a whole other podcast about this shit. But uh, I'm just really, saying I can't do that shit but, anymore, man. I, but I will say I that I think that I think they've done a good job of making all those stories really way more interconnected, and every episode does have little bits that feed to the bigger arching story. Uh, but I do understand your villain of the week bullshittedness. Uh, but let's move on now, Brando. Let's get into the Survivor Series card that is totally reshaped. Uh, it starts there. I mean, there's like a lot of things to cover. We'll start we with Monday because Monday, the New Day came out and cost uh, Ambrose and Rollins the tag team titles. I was actually legitimately surprised. Um, that, yeah, I, I was too. I, that's not what I was expecting to happen. And so... That has now reshaped the the new tag team champions. The bar, Sheamus and Cesaro, will meet the Usos, the two tag team champions. Now, Nate, um, I was so mad, so mad, the way they ended the Cesaro and Sheamus best of seven. And uh, then they made them a tag team. Now, I don't want these guys to split up. Well, duh, they're amazing together. And I love that they had, a, you know, they started their tag team um, as kind of like still bitter rivals, so there wasn't a connectedness, and then it took uh, it took Sheamus showing Cesaro his inner heel 
to change them. And then when they got the when they started the you know we don't set the bar, we are the bar. Like they rebuilt their gimmicks in such a brilliant way, and it works for them. They're top guys. They deserve the belts again. I love that the Usos are who they're going to have a match against. I mean, there are some dope tag team matches that are just going to happen on this card. Like, the tag team match is one thing, but there's still a triple threat we have to talk about now. Yeah, yeah. um, um, Yeah, we're going to get there. But what I really like about the bar is that they are really the Hollywood blondes of this generation. Yes. And what I mean by that is that you had Steve Austin and Brian Pillman got put together because they had nothing for them to do. Uh, you know, Austin thought he was getting a singles push, and obviously plans had changed. So where do, what do we do with them? We got these two guys. They were literally designed to get other people over, really. So uh, they were just put together, and what do they do? You know, Austin, on his end, he's he's kind of deflated. He's like, this isn't. I was told I was getting a U.S. title push with Harley Race as my manager. He's thinking, I mean, I'm I just missed my shot. Now I'm stuck in this tag team. And Brian's like, no, man, you don't get it. I, that that was Austin almost. I was trying to do a raspy Brian. It's hard to um, nail Brian's voice down because he is very raspy. But he's like, man, you don't get it, man. You know, we can do something with this, dude. We need to we, we, like, we need to come up with a finish. We're a tag team. And then they, um, like, like all the stuff, the brainchild of the blondes was all Brian. He's like, we need to match. We need to get gear. And Austin just had gear made. <laughs> so then they based their new like their gear off on the gear that Austin just had made. So that was where the red star was. And so they had that and they tweaked a few things and then uh Brian's like, We need to get these gold necklaces. It'll set us apart. So Austin got his gold necklace that he still wears to this day. And then uh, and then they started coming up you know uh, with when you know, with catchphrases. I'm I'm trying to like your brush with greatness or whatever, you know. That was like their type thing. And then they would do the whole little reel. The, the, the sizzle reel, the camera reel during the match. Yep. And then they just had a nice little rapport where, where Brian was like the big uh, high, kind of like the high flyer. And one would even think like the big talker during the promos because he kind of did more of the talking. Because uh, Steve could talk, but he wasn't Austin. He wasn't still cold yet, obviously. But he had Austin unleashed. Just, right, yes, no. But, I mean, he's still uh, they, they were so entertaining. They went and they got themselves over. And you then because they got themselves over, they got split up, <laughs> uh, which is because and, and then by that point, they didn't want to split up. They, you know, they like they were buds. They were like, you know, they had worked so hard. Did they transition that directly into the Pillman Austin feud that happens? Was uh, that them split? Is that how they split them? They did one match the, with the Pillman Austin feud. Austin turned and went with Colonel Parker and um, he ended up going to be U.S. champion. Brian ended up. In a contract dispute, stayed away for a while, and ended up coming back as Flying Brian, and uh, eventually would join the Horsemen. And Steve would it, Steve would eventually end up getting fired. And then when Steve went to ECW, got signed the, by the WWF, then it was like right after that, Brian facilitated a work. Like, like leaving of WCW. He left WCW because he and Eric orchestrated it. Damn, and, I didn't know that actually. And uh, basically, he was going to go down to ECW, go to some, and get some more heat. And and they were going to make it seem like that that Brian was too extreme for WCW, and then he was going to come back and try to feud with Hogan. Interesting. Uh, however, Brian kind of worked Bischoff a little bit. Brian was trying to go to the WWF. But I think the way Brian saw it was either either way, you know, I'm out of my WCW contract. Come, come down here, get, rile up the place, rile up the internet, rile up the wrestling fans. No matter where I go, if I go where I want to go, I'm getting big money. If I go back to WCW, I'm getting big money, and they want to try and put me with Hogan. So either way, you know, he was like, 
thinking this is going to be better for him. And then so right when he was going to be signed, he had his car wreck, which screw, you know, screwed him up. Yep. And then they did the Austin and Pillman feud. They, they didn't hide the fact on you – know, now, this is not – they didn't come out and say it, but they alluded to the fact that Pillman and Brian were former partners and friends. They didn't say the blondes. They didn't say WCW, but they alluded to that. And they would partner them up in talking sometimes with – Brian was doing interview stuff sometimes. I think Brian had like a segment where he would do something, come out and say some wacky stuff. And uh, – of course, that ended up leading to Brian needed another. He ended up leaving for another surgery, so they used Austin to pulmonize the, you know, the the fused ankle. But getting back on track, sure, yeah. Uh, with 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 the bar, I really feel like that that these guys are probably one of the better tag teams in the entire company right now. Uh, and, and and there's a lot of good ones, a lot of good. But these guys were two single guys that came together and made the best of it in chicken shit in a chicken life. salad, bro. Dude, it's the tastiest, you know, <laughs> chicken salad I think I've tasted in a while in the wrestling business. This is really cool. I feel you, you mentioned a triple threat, and I think kind of what you meant was six-man tag. Thank you. Yeah, totally fucking botched and that. So what, now what we're going to see, I really, you know, you said it seemed like a tornado hit WWE headquarters. And hit somebody in the head. Really, I just think it knocked their papers all around. And then when they got their papers back together, like, oh yeah, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to we're going to do. They're, just, they're, they're, they're so they're so just gone. They don't even know what they're doing anymore. You just but, gave uh, me a visual in my head of them in front of a dry erase board, and only certain names have been erased, and they're trying to remember what goes where. <laughs> and they're just like, oh yeah, I think we wrote AJ here, right? AJ is who we wrote with Brock. Okay, cool. Uh, but back to the, the six-man tag. I'm sorry. All right. So um, I think what they realized here is that they have a real chance with this Survivor Series to do some dream matches. And uh, we're and we're getting a couple of those here. And and this is one of them. The Absolutely. Shield versus the New Day. You know, it, it, it kind of works out because originally Roman was going to be involved in the Survivor Series team, you know. For Team Raw, on um, like, like like you know for the men's, and uh, I think they realize that they have a much better like. What do we? Uh, and, we and we talked about this maybe on the last episode where it's like some some people are going to be left out in the dust because there's only so many spots, there's only so many matches that we can have, and really when I looked at the match listing, I, I said last week a best of seven. Well, there's one match on here that isn't Raw versus SmackDown, so you're going to have seven Raw versus SmackDown matches still if you add an eighth match into, into, into this. And so it, with Roman being cleared at the last minute, it seems, we're going to get the Shield versus the New Day. And, of course, the Shield's going to win because this is the first official Shield reunion match. Since they didn't have it at uh, TLC. Exactly. So the Shield has to win here. But the New Day can be, you know, they, I think they're going to put on just a fantastic uh, match here, because you, you don't want to you don't want to book the Shield being too dominant against the New Day, but I think people you can kind of expect the Shield to be a little tougher than the New Day, and then and then the New Day using more more of a shenanigans to try and get the upper hand. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, the thing that is interesting here is, you know, no matter how you kind of sliced it, uh, if Roman wasn't cleared, you could still technically do this match and just have, you know, one of the New Day on the outside floating like they typically do. Uh, but I love this because you have the longest reigning tag champs of all time. Arguably, I know there's the whole debate on based on titles and whatnot. Uh, the New Day. And then they're going to... Uh, you had said that they're working on making them like the overall longest reigning as in most title, most days with the titles, right? So that's like you have this superstar team and then you have the Shield who, like you said, they haven't had their win yet. They had their first big comeback. But I think that it is super smart and safe to say that the Shield is going to win here, like you said, because it doesn't make sense to put New Day over here. 
They've accomplished so much already. They have so many accolades. What is, oh, well, they beat the shield. What's that going to do for the business? Nothing. It's not going to add to anything. The shield winning gives Roman and the whole team huge momentum. Maybe Ambrose and Rollins challenge again against the bar when the title's back. Roman goes off to do his thing with Brock. Whatever. You know, that seems like the fate we're in. So I'm looking forward to this match, but this is not the only, really, two matches now have been affected because one match got added, the Shield versus the New Day, and then, of course, the tag title match has changed now, the Bar versus the Usos. That's gonna, Those are two guaranteed at least four-and-a-half-star matches on that card, without question. I, like, I don't have to even think. I know they're going to be amazing matches that I'll want to make sure to catch and tune into with no question. Uh, a very large man. Yeah. My age. He was he was my age. He, he graduated 2009 Wrestled with me. He and played football. He is a, a <laughs> Delphi championship wrestler. Yeah. Played I don't think he played football. No, I'm pretty sure he played football. Maybe at one point, maybe, maybe in middle school. On, but, I mean, he was very much so into wrestling. Yeah, he was he was mostly wrestling. Like a very well-built man. Very tall, <laughs> very well-built. Very into black metal, death metal. <laughs> Still is. All of that shit. Heavy as shit. <laughs> he, he's the guy that introduced me to a lot of stuff. And he, he, he is the only person to this day that I've seen take down the ogre. He took down the ogre. <laughs> <laughs> he took down the ogre in a pit. Oh, I wish I could have seen that. beeline for him. The ogre was... No, I think he used someone else as a weapon. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, used, he, used an, with a, with a he used an equally large person as a throwing device. <laughs> uh, he, he threw this other person into the ogre and knocked, and toppled the ogre. Justice the ogre, was served that day. The ogre like is Shadow maybe... Yeah, the ogre is <laughs> taller than Wes, that's for sure. Maybe equal size, but taller. Just hear the sound of... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, and Wes goes, Ay! That's my dad's truck! <laughs> and Corey's like, oh shit! <laughs> Instantly retreats. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Wes, of course, was not serious whatsoever. He's he's the giantest teddy bear. Teddy bear. Teddy bear. Despite listening to all this fucking church burning music and shit. Yeah, um, that's how it usually goes. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds similar to me, except the church burning. So that music. was Mayhem. <laughs> yes, that was that was our first Mayhem festival. Oh, Miss good those times. shows. Good times. We have another show coming up this Sunday. Yes, yes, we do. In the wake of an album dropping. Woo! Yes. Uh, Trivium just released The Sin and The Sentence, the follow-up to Silence in the Snow. Another solid album. And, uh, yes, a, a solid album, a very different album. From Silence in the Snow was the first record to feature only clean vocals. Yep. Yet still remain just as fucking heavy. Yep. Um, the the music... lack of Draymond, though, was kind of disappointing. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I fucking hate Vengeance Falls. <laughs> Vengeance Falls. I was so looking forward to that album. I was kind of let down by that one, too. Yeah, so I found out, when I found out that uh, David Draymond would be producing the album, I was like, okay, Arr! this is pretty fucking exciting, because I love Disturbed. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, uh. But, and I, I, I read interviews and how David Draymond helped Matt Heffy with um, all of his like vocal mel melodies and structuring the melodies and all that shit. What I didn't know was that basically David Draymond recorded all the parts himself and then said, hey, Matt, copy exactly what I did. Uh. <laughs> I don't know if that's what happened, but just <laughs> what it, that's what it fucking sounds like. Use okay? your guitar work, but put my vocals in there. Yeah, the, the music on Vengeance Falls was yeah. absolutely outstanding. Agreed. Uh, but the vocals, just it was, it was David Draymond. I it was, know it was that. Matt Draymond. I know was... that In Waves is like their title track off of that album. No, it's not. I... That's it's off not. of In Waves. <laughs> oh, crap. In really? Waves is the title track off of In Waves. <laughs> no. No <laughs> way. So falls. what's off of Vengeance Falls then? Strive. Strive. Oh. Uh, Villainy Thrives. Villainy Thrives. 
Which those uh, are bad Brave songs. the Storm. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I feel like In Waves kind of belongs on that album then. Because no. it's literally no. like the same four lyrics. Unpopular this opinion. Get out of here. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Proceed. I mean, I don't know. I In Waves I enjoyed, but... I loved In Waves. I enjoyed In Waves, but I feel like... The first, I don't know, to me personally, like, I enjoyed, like, the first half and then the back half just kind of... I just love watching just Heavy Heffy up. use all <laughs> of the same antics every time they sing in waves. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> Which I love we will that. probably see on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We're going to. I love that in waves album because it's it's the first album that came out. I, I tend to gravitate towards the first album that comes out while I'm a fan of them. So I mean, I had already be I had already I been that. a fan like by listening to the Crusade and Shogun um, at that oh, point. Shogun. That's very true because I'm like a big fan of Shogun, and that was the first album yeah. that I heard by them. I love Shogun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will like I always. I'm a person that likes to. Uh, everybody's like, "What's your favorite album?" I was like, "Well, I can tell you. I can split it up. I can tell you what my favorite album is, but I can also tell you what their best album is, and then sometimes they're not always the same." Right. Right. Uh, I will tell you. Shogun is their best album. Preach. With a fidency as a close Preach. second. Yes, but my favorite album. <laughs> well, my opinion. Th- my, at the time, my favorite album was In Waves. Mm-hmm. Now, like, however... <laughs> it is. The Sin in the Sentence. Mm-hmm. It, it has taken the lead. Um, and it, it might even take the lead for best album. Mm. I, I'm feeling very similar. I mean, I told Amanda... Like I'm like you need to like give oh, this yeah. out. Like you, you know what Scott to did this. to you with Parkway Drive. It's what he's doing with me and Trivium and it's in the sentence right now. Yeah, like I feel I, that's what I did with you and Trivium in general. Too. Yeah, I know. I was going to bring that up. Like he introduced Parkway Drive to you. Like he introduced Trivium to me. So I I've always just associated them. Like, we'd be them. like driving to like <laughs> or riding with mom and dad to lunch and yep. or going out somewhere. And we would always have our iP our you know our MP3 players. We didn't have iPods back then because mm-hmm. we were very much against Apple at that time. <laughs> All right, Daniel. <laughs> now, yeah, yeah. now we have iPhones that. and iPads. And yeah, then now it's pretty much strictly. I mean, man, is not so much. I mean, she has an, an iPod, but I have my listen. original iPod yeah. still. Thank you. And we would always what? listen to our music, and I would just remember we'd always have our headbuds in, and we'd be like, "Dude, listen to this," you know, <laughs> we'd like pass it mm-hmm. and just share it all and. That is the fiasco that I'm in right now because I still have my original iPod. It no longer syncs new music. And so the last album that I have by like any band is like two albums ago. <laughs> and I'm really struggling with this because I don't want to buy CDs. I well, still just can't bring myself punch, to do that. That's not such a bad thing. But... What? <laughs> they fine. came out with a new song recently. Trouble or whatever. I don't really pay too much attention I, to Five Finger Death Punch anymore. I don't so. either. It just oh, came up God. on my feed. <laughs> I mean, that's an American it. capitalist. I just pretty much <laughs> just oh, Wrong off. Side of Heaven, part okay, one. Wrong side I'll give of it heaven, part, part one. one. Mm-hmm. Part Grew two. On me. Part two was okay. It had some songs that I loved, and yeah. the rest was eh. However, got mo- your six. moving forward to Got Your Six, <laughs> that album was horrendous. Would you, or would you compare it to... American Capitalist, yes, because I hated American Capitalist. Uh, After a time. Fair. But <laughs> would you compare it to Temper Temper? Oh, God. Oh, no. As, like, we don't speak of, like, of that we album. We don't speak of that. She's right. But I'm just saying, like, because, like, you know, we had, like, Bullet right and we were... Right from the sirens, right from the wall. <laughs> Brian! 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 Me and Nick Maxson <laughs> made fun of that album so much. They made fun of that song so much. Along yeah. with Tears Don't Fall Part 2. What the fuck, uh, Bullet? I'm so glad they came out of that and released Venom because Venom is amazing. They're recording a new album starting this month. Awesome. Hopefully Woo. they stay in the right direction. Yeah, you Hopefully guys know which way you need to go. Positive feedback they need, and they're like, "All right, this is the sound that we need to just." There we yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I think with Five Finger Death Punch, which I'm I'm very over that band. Me too. Yeah. Um, yep. And I don't know if it's just because they I become jaded on them in general. Like I'm I'm the same way with Disturbed at this moment. Until they release a new CD, of course, then I'll be obsessed with. Immortalized was okay. I liked it a lot. I liked it better than uh, Asylum. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, I'd put them on like a sub a level like similar plane for me. Well, it was it just sounded so different from the rest of their work. Yeah, um, which is crazy. Uh, I disturbed. know for disturbed for yeah. them to ever sound anything different. That's, for me, yeah. for me, that's um, a feat. It was the best album since Indestructible, which Indestructible is probably my favorite. No, uh, no, Indestructible is probably their best. 
Indestructible is their best, while so Believe good. is my favorite. Yeah, that's a good the, one. And this, mm -hmm. I, I am saying all of this, completely excluding the sickness, it's on its own level. Um... I feel like if you say, you know, my favorite album is The Sickness. It's like no but fucking you can't, shit, it's your favorite. But it's like you can't mention their newest <laughs> albums, you're a bandwagoner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but back to Five Finger Death Punch. I don't know if it's just because I'm jaded on them from listening to them so much in the past, or if it's because their music's gotten shittier and shittier. Mm. But Some damn maybe it's because their mental though. health is getting shittier and shittier. Yeah. I mean, Ivan, Ivan take I'm, a break. I'm very over the antics with Ivan. Uh -huh. Whatever, whatever's going on, whether it be real or just whatever. The PR I don't stunt. Know. Several years ago, Five Finger Death Punch up put hella shows on though. Oh yeah, I've I've always oh. enjoyed their live show, yep. Yep. especially in like a smaller smaller venue setting. Small the bleeding at the first mayhem was brutal. Oh yeah, uh, yeah back White when Knuckles the fest was yes. just... White Knuckles when they had the Wall of Death. <sighs> Good yeah, stuff. and all that fucking dust popping up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my first crowd surfing experience was with Five Finger Death Punch oh, at nice. the first Mayhem Festival. Mine was Take This also, Life was by In Flames. Was that not just literally just grabbed it, you and pretty much thrust no, you? No, it was <laughs> it was Corey Cook and Ransom Cornwall. Okay, two yeah. other fairly big guys. <laughs> uh, they going back to Mayhem one. Um, okay, so there's two stories here involving both of them. <laughs> they. For, okay, so the crowd surfing thing, they just looked at each other and said, hey, you're going to crowd surf. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and Bye. they just picked me up and did it. <laughs> and at the time, there was a huge pit going on during Five Finger Death Punch, of course. Surprise. And it was just nothing but dust. And I, I, mm. I, I was very, Death. I was very <laughs> um, inexperienced with moshing. Like, I had never done it. I... I, I I was scared to fucking death of it. I weighed like 112 pounds. Sopping what? It, it just wasn't a good idea for me. So of course the crowd is taking me directly towards this pit, and I land in the pit, and I am just like, this is where it ends. I'm like, this is where it ends. And, and you know that? Have, have you guys seen um, the Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, the third one? I fell asleep during that one. You know, you know, you know, at the end where. The, the one captain from the East India Trading Company is like completely defeated and like his ship's blowing up around him and he's just walking down the ship. And it's a, it's a really cool piece of cinema because like everything is like blowing up in slow motion. He's just walking. It's just like this completely dead face on. And, he, and he, dead inside. Like, he's completely dead inside. He knows he's defeated. And he's just walking. And then next thing you know, the ship just blows up because like he's, the, he's getting bombarded by the Black Pearl and, um, whatever the fucking other ship is that um, Davy Jones was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is that what you felt like in the middle of the pit? That's exactly what I felt like, and I, <laughs> I did that exact walk back to the crowd. Because <laughs> I was in the middle of the pit, and I just walked straight out. <laughs> Avoid eye contact. I, I just walked. I was like... Don't make any sudden movements. I was movements. so... Fucking, <laughs> the, the fear had deadened me inside. Good luck. There's a problem with the Switch. Is it the problem I've been having? I didn't know that you've been having a problem. The left Joy-Con goes dead. Ah, well, okay, that's uh, that's it's actually... Dead, dead, it doesn't receive the signal. Like I've That's even... actually a noted problem with the Switch. Yeah, I've actually moved my Switch, as I point and nobody else can see it other than you guys. I moved it from next to the TV, where the blue cable is. I mm -hmm. moved it all the way over here next to the Pit Boy. Because it's literally right where I game, and I still lose it. Even when I'm not blocking it, it just drops. Huh. So Dead stick? Dead stick. It's every time. And then I have to, like, stop, let go of everything. I would look up because uh, I know they had an issue with that. Yeah, but definitely but. frustrating. And there's nothing I could do about it unless I buy, like, an updated Joy-Con once they come out. Like, maybe they fixed it, but it's on a newer Joy-Con. I would have to buy a new Joy-Con to, to fix that. You can buy the red ones... But yeah, but they're also forty dollars a piece. They are. So if I'm going to do that, okay, I'm going to buy. Can, you can buy a full pack. You can get a cool, like yeah, collector's edition ones. You well, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for a specific one. Metroid Prime Four. Four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one comes out. 
I will probably be buying a shitload of stuff. All right. So the problem I'm talking about is the problem with space. And uh, apparently, uh, for example, like uh, L.A. Noir comes out uh, pretty soon. If well, By the time this episode drops, it might already be out, if not right around this time. It's going to be about 29 gigabytes. And so it barely fits on the little Wii U uh, game card. Yes. Those hold 32 gigabytes. And uh, it's going to be update. There's going to be a big update for fixing bugs, glitches, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And well, that update, if I remember correctly, is like five to seven gigabytes. That goes over your system memory of 32 gigabytes. So you are going to need expanded memory, which was just something that we all knew was going to be a problem. Now, that's if you download your games. If you have the game card and you have like a few gigabytes to spare, that, that, that's fine. But if you download exclusively, which for mobile things or for just in general nowadays, uh, they really encourage people to download. If you download your games, you are going to be hurting for certain for space. Yes. So uh, there's this little story came out uh, because Nintendo has banded up with SanDisk. He's, he's, trying, like. to sneak, he's trying to <laughs> sneak, a, sneak a pet to the dog meat. Nintendo's banded up with SanDisk to uh, release a officially licensed micro SD card for the Nintendo Switch. Pretty cool. Awesome. Right. That's yep. uh, you know, yep. I mean, uh, Nintendo's reaching out to these uh, to, to some of these makers and uh-huh. hey, let's partner up here. Let's get this going cuz obviously people are going to need this. Well, the problem is is that the Nintendo branded ones are way more expensive versus the exact same make of card yep. that you can get. So, the SanDisk 64 gigabyte micro SD card on Amazon probably runs you about 20, 23, 25 bucks. I bought I bought mine for fourteen. Fourteen for a six. Yeah, I was, was going to say twenty six bucks might sound a little bit on the high on the super high side. Conservatively. Yeah. Okay. Now that same gigabytes uh, amount of gigabytes with for the for the Nintendo Switch licensed is about a hundred bucks. <laughs> wow, that's not even a small jump. No, that is <laughs> gigantic. Yeah, I was going to say maybe if it was you know thirty five or forty bucks. No, that okay, is because there there are some people that only they don't want to buy, um, you know, the Mad Cats yes. of the old days. Right. They don't they don't want to buy things that aren't fully licensed and branded. I get it, but if you know anything about SD cards, they're pretty interchangeable, especially when it's the same brand. Right. The only difference is is that the officially licensed might be a little faster. Right. Now. Same price. Uh, I'm sorry. Same, uh, same same amount of space for a Samsung High Speed, which is what they're doing. The Sandisk one for mm-hmm. hundred bucks, about thirty bucks. So seventy dollars cheaper. All right. Let's say you want some more space. Say you want 128 gigabytes plus the 32 on the system. That'll put you probably about 150 gigabytes, maybe 140. You know, pretty decent amount of space for your save games and a pretty decent library. Of, of games that you download there. I mean, sure you're going to have some big downloads, but then you got Mario Odyssey, it's only like 5 gigabytes or so. And uh, like Breath of the Wild is only like maybe like 10, 13. Right. Not terrible. So the Samsung High Speed 128 uh, gigabyte, 150 bucks. It's like half the price of the Switch itself. The Nintendo branded 128 SanDisk one is $200. And you can buy SanDisk. Or another make, 128 gig, because I've been watching, because I want to buy one. 80 bucks. 8 bucks? 80. Oh, no, eight. I was, was, was going to say, say that, wow, 8 bucks. <laughs> but it usually that's ranges. That's a hell of a sale. Those usually <laughs> range to, that's on sale, obviously, but usually it's about 110 to 120 on Amazon right now, through the because I've been really sifting through those. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at 120, and you know, a high speed is 150, which really $30 high speed, I might consider that. But two hundred dollars for the not high speed one because it says Nintendo on it. No I do thanks. believe that is like the higher speed one. They, uh, those are the higher speed ones that they're doing for the licensed. But Still. literally, it doesn't really affect your performance that much. You know, it, it's like going from a it's like going from a uh, hybrid uh, hard drive to an SSD. Mm-hmm. You're talking about a matter of maybe like maybe at most six to ten seconds. Right. And, uh, like, I don't know about you guys, but I come from an era where the first uh, disc-based loading games, it took forever. <laughs> you know, I, I remember buying, specifically, I'm calling this one out, uh, it was the first like, SmackDown wrestling <laughs> game 
for <laughs> PS2. And the loading and saving took forever. Yeah. yeah. I could go, take a crap, come back, it'd still be there. <laughs> it would not move. Yeah. It took forever. So I understand that this is the era of people wanting things now. Get it done now. Boom. Why am I still looking at a screen? Why is it still loading? People are so impatient. But I think this is kind of ridiculous. Uh, me, me and you, Mike, we just talked about how, like, man, the cards are probably going to start coming down soon. And then the next day I read this or saw this in a video, whatever it was, and I was like, well, that is the exact opposite of what we thought. Yeah. Uh, this is the, not to a point, but like Sony, we talked about Sony and for the PSP and for the Vita had uh, proprietary memory cards. They mm -hmm. were only made by Sony, so therefore they could control the price. Yep. You couldn't change it out. You had to do a you know, XYZ. You know, you needed that memory card. You needed more space. Yep. And you had to buy the bullet and get a card. That, to, to an extent, I feel like that pushed some people away. Because they're thinking, I need to put all the money down to buy this $200 Vita, plus another 80 to get X amount of memory. Right. Too much. And uh, I do like the, the workaround that people have found now that the Vita is no longer supported. If you get a 3G, people are tearing them apart, taking those wires, so basically soldering in a micro SD, mm -hmm. and then you can put in however much memory you want at yeah. that point. Which to me, that's it fantastic idea especially yes, yeah. and that is now not supported so now they're not going to be like oh you hacked it shut right. it off now they don't care you know, right? I, mean, I mean people have been hacking the PSTVs for a while right and in, in, in a much different way but yeah with the three the only problem is is that there's only so many 3G models out there and people now are selling them in the marketplace since this is going on for $200 yeah, yeah. So I've I, seen three I, of I them. imagine that they would shoot back up in price because I just have the Wi-Fi version I didn't bother to get the 3G version I had a choice between the 3G or the Wi-Fi, and I went with the Wi-Fi because I have Wi-Fi, yeah. and I could we used it for like Skype and you yeah. know Netflix and stuff. It's really cool. And, and then for the Slim, they didn't release a 3G version uh, exactly. on the Slim at all. Because so. that's what I got was the Slim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh... my question is, who is just which? Is it Sandisk or Nintendo that's justifying this cost? Is it Sandisk saying, well, we're going to charge more for this? Because it's kind of an inconvenience, I, I or is it no, Nintendo? I, I would know, say Nintendo. Logically, you would point fingers at Nintendo right away, but I mean, do we know who is justifying this extra cost? I'm gonna say that it's probably Sandisk has the final say because it's their product, right? Right. Because it's officially licensed, that means Nintendo says you do it, we'll approve it. You can put our name on it. You put our name on it. Put a lo put our logo on it. And approve it. It's just like last week we talked about you had that controller, the Power A controller. Yes. It's an officially licensed controller from uh, from Power A. It's made by Power A. It's priced by Power A. The only, the only say so that Nintendo has in it is, well, what are you putting on it? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then so they probably have to approve the arts or whatever. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, fine. Yeah, oh, yeah, I whatever. really said that they don't have the HD rumble in that. 30 bucks, you know, 30, uh, $30 controller. Like, what it's good for Mario. Yeah. Mario Kart. I mean, that's pretty much what I bought it for. Is like, if you want to come over and play Mario Kart together, you have an extra controller. Right. The Joy-Con. Eh, I like the I like that Power A controller for Mario Kart for sure. But uh, but for the official license, I, I would say that it would be Sandisk setting the price, saying, "Well, we have the Nintendo branding on it. We can charge a little bit more for this." And how much do you want to bet that they're targeting? Uh, like uh, very ignorant parents mm -hmm. here, people who have don't know their technology. People that well, I gotta buy the Nintendo one because it's for a Nintendo console, and it yeah. says high speed on and it. And it says high speed, uh, so then it's gonna be up to the salesperson at Best Buy or uh, a GameStop, wherever they're selling these, mm -hmm. to, to push that on them because number one, it's the higher priced. Right. Number two, their store makes more money. Yeah. So. Well, well didn't, didn't you didn't you say sorry to interrupt? But that's all right. Didn't you say that Nintendo Online is sold out? The online store for Nintendo is sold out on those. So it, you can go to Amazon right now and buy the cheaper ones right now mm -hmm. yeah. for sixty four gigabytes. Mike, you can go for twenty bucks right now and get one. Uh, but like, why would you spend eighty dollars more? I I spend so much money in my freaking gaming collection. I have eight hundred and something fucking games in my collection. And you would be surprised how much money 
A, I have spent, and B, I haven't spent. Yes, you know? yes. I have made some excellent deals. You just made an excellent deal on that Xbox get a while back for 50 bucks. Oh, yeah, I bought yeah. an Xbox 360 mm -hmm. with a Kinect, and what was it like? It was like 19 games. 19 games? Some bucks. of them were the Kinect games, but he had a nice Still, little Still, I mean, of them. we had the 250 gigabyte. It was... I can't believe it when she did... Uh, yeah, go ahead. And then like, we had on. the whole, like, the system is in Japanese. We can't figure out how to change the language. That was interesting. <laughs> so we're, it's like two chimps trying to do a math problem over here. We're trying to figure and out. And there's a change. light bulb involved somewhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, okay, uh, I'm a pretty cheap-ass collector. I will spend the money when I want something. Well, all of us are cheap-ass collectors in general. <laughs> I will spend the money when I really want something. But for a memory card, I'm going to go as cheap as I can. So, while still getting a good quality product. I, I said this today to you. I don't understand why somebody... I mean, people are have torn apart a Vita and made a slot to put a micro SD card. Why hasn't anybody made a micro SD dock that plugs into a micro SD slot, slot. and added four? Let's just say four. Right now, if you did that, since... Nintendo's not set to where you have to run this specific thing. You could literally plug that in, go spend 80 bucks, and get what? Like, what would that be? 120? That's 256 gigabytes for less than $100. And it actually, yeah, because if you're getting that much, you would probably spend, uh, what, 150, 200 bucks mm -hmm. just to get that size of memory. So, I mean, make it, make it, make it so. Number but two. the one Number the one. one question I would have is how how fast would uh, you're getting blown up, sir? How fast would Nintendo or how quickly would Nintendo say, well, we don't we don't sanction this, basically? Well, they can't really. Not that they can, but you know, they, they would have to. I mean, it would be it's there would be hardware. grumblings. Yeah, there's no software involved as long as the the uh, the dock read each like they make now a dual card for the PSP where you can plug in two SSD cards or micro SD cards into it mm -hmm. and plug it in and only reads it as one memory. So they have a teeny tiny little one for the old duo. Can you tell me that somebody can't make a dock? Right. I mean... But, you know, that was the best thing about uh, getting into the PSP again. Yes. Is that, you know, you go on Amazon and I think I got like 32-something gigabyte micro SD card that plugs into a, a shell Pro Duo stick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 32 gigabytes, you, can, you have all the memory you'll ever need. Cool. And then, like I said, they came out with a new dual side. For four, it's like yeah. 11 to $14. And you just pop in each side, slide in there, it reads it all as one. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, there might be some money to be made there. You're listening to the Voice of Survival Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Nate Phillips. And we are back! Whew! That was strange. Somebody took over my podcast for like 26 minutes. I feel like I had a god in my brain. I just watched uh, Thor of the Dark World again, so now now that's stuck in my head. Anyways, I'm uh, I, now that I've taken over the podcast again, let's talk to the creator of that podcast who is here via Skype for the first time ever on my podcast. Actually, actually for the first time ever. I've never Skyped anybody before. Nate, how does it feel to be uh, my first ever Skype call? I guess it's better than sloppy seconds, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, right? Seems pretty cool. Um I know, Thanks man. Techn technology. I can call people through computers. So this is this is amazing. Nate, you created a podcast and sent it into me for my first ever Incepticast. It's called a Journey into Comics. So let's let's dig into this. Let's talk about this a little bit. Right off the bat, I want to say that I the recording sounded fantastic. Uh, your vocal the vocal tone is great. I didn't hear a whole lot of background noise. How did how did you record this? Um, in my personal studio. Uh... Actually, where my father lives, which is two hours away from me, we have our own studio where we've done uh, full albums and whatnot. 
but uh, I had a night to myself there, and I went for it. And so this is like this is like a, a music quality recording studio. Yes, yes, absolutely. That explains a lot because I was going to say, like, uh, you know, I, I really, I felt like the tone was crisp, uh, the mic sounded great, your voice sounds great. I think you've got a, I think you've got a great, uh, great broadcasting voice. It's got a, a nice sonority to it. Wow, thank you very much. That's uh, an awesome compliment, especially coming from you. Oh, so. well, hey, I, I, I do not think I have a particularly great broadcasting voice. I sound nasal and stuffed up constantly. So I'm, I'm giving you props there. Oh, well, thank you very much. So yeah, um, I used the uh, Shure SM7B to record my vocals on. A, a classic, uh, one of the a, a famous vocal microphone. It is like the best microphone in the whole entire world. But I thought, well, I record my vocals with it, I might as well just talk through it. And it actually came out exactly how I was hoping. Yeah, often I mean, oftentimes what works in like a, in like a vocal scenario works. I find works just as well. That's a is that that's a dynamic mic, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like I really like the way dynamics sound for podcasting. It it really it picks up the full frequency range. I think that you need. Uh, I completely agree with that. So, um, it just gives your voice such a warm tone when you're talking right, into right? it. Right. You know? Yeah. So. so. Uh, so okay, so let's so that out of the way, let's dive into you what you talked about on the podcast. And right off the bat, um, I was thrown a little bit because it's called Journey into Comics. But uh, right off the bat, you started getting into uh, your your work life. Your life as a blackjack dealer. Yeah, um, you know, I I had recorded a earlier take of my podcast, and it was just like, hey, this is comics, and it was there was no connection to who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. And I always found that when I'm listening to anybody on radio or podcast, if I know a little bit about the person, I'm instantly going to connect a lot quicker than if I'm just listening for information. I think that's totally true. I do. I mean, I do want to know about your background. And I think uh, I I really like the stories you were told about being a blackjack dealer. You made it sound like this uh, this like weird combination of drug dealer and best friend to like pick them, pick them back up again after they've blown all their money. It it really is. Um, <laughs> You know, um, the only thing about the the dealing is, like, my schedule is so messed up. I'm working 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. every day. So, like, my concept of morning is, like, late afternoon for most people. Well, and you're in a casino, which traditionally, you know, like, you don't see see any clocks and there's no natural light, so it just feels like this, like, eternal day. That's got to, that does have to, that probably does throw you. Oh, yeah. But that's (laughs) why I, uh... Do a lot of comic book reading, you know, in my in my spare time. Do you honestly? Do you feel guilty about the blackjack thing? The way you made it sound, you're like, uh, man, you're you're luring people into this like dark world where they lose all their money, and then you're there to like pat them on the back and uh, say, hey, it's okay, give it one more round. You can do it. You can you can get back on the horse. It just it just depends how you look at it. Um, some days I do definitely feel sorry for certain people that gamble, uh, especially newbies that don't really know what's going on. But as right. far as the what we call regular gamblers that I see every night when I'm at work... I mean, I guess you figure they know what they're getting into. They absolutely know what they're getting into, and if they have an attitude and they're angry, they're only mad at themselves, they just don't realize it. Right. Oh, do, do people, like, yell at you all the time? Like, you... you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my favorite thing to come back with people is they, you know, they try to say something insulting, and it's usually they're not trying too hard and i'm like look if you're going to insult me you're going to have to try harder my mother said worse to me do you ever get do you ever get accused of cheating yeah actually i have people uh sometimes there are there are shuffle machines for the cards not always certain games don't have those right but sometimes uh, people will be like oh that machine knows how to deal the cards and i'm like do you understand that it's a binary code and like it doesn't know how many people are on this game it doesn't know what the dealers position is on the game right no it's right it's not like sorting cards to screw you out of money that's like impossible exactly it's literally just house advantage so i really i i actually i I thought that stuff was fascinating i really liked hearing about your career i did think that was an odd choice to start off your your first episode oftentimes what i what i like to hear from from like a pilot episode of a podcast you're right that you want to hear something about the person but i think you i think what you want to hear most of all is kind of outlining the vision for the podcast you know what this is going to be about what this is you know what sort of material you're going to be talking about and at first i didn't really hear that so i was unsure what i was listening to especially because it wasn't comic related yeah that's true i mean um when i first 
recorded my first take of the pilot, I initially was going to call it my comic book life because it kind of tied in my personal life with what I enjoy. But then I thought, well, that could throw people off because I'm going to mainly talk about comic books and nerdy video games and such, you know. Is this kind of, is it kind of like it's, you're talking about your life like through the prism of comics or through the prism of your interests? Well, yes um, and no. I find that I connect to, I mean, in, in the podcast, I talked a little bit about, like, my collecting, and that is such a big part of who I am outside of comics. Right. Um, I'm very much a completionist, so, uh, you know, when it comes to doing something, I go as hard as I can to make sure it's as, as great as it can be. So I wanted to, in my podcast, kind of give people a touch of every part of me and just say, hope you like it. And I think that's cool. I, I think all the, I think all, hearing about your life is really interesting. But the way I, I would have started might have been like, hey, my name is Nate. Uh, so a little bit of what you're going to be in for on this podcast is talking about comics and then maybe get into, hey, here's a little bit about me and my background. Yeah, that's actually like a really great idea. I wish I would have heard that idea before I put it out there, but that's all right. Hey, I mean, the, the, the whole point is, like, it's a pilot episode. You're trying, you're trying things out. You're seeing what works and what doesn't. Yeah, definitely. This is, that's what I talked about on my own pilot episode, is I have no idea what this is going to turn into. You just want to... You, you record it, you throw it out there, and then you listen and you see what's working and what's not. Yeah, absolutely. And so far, Josh Figures It Out is probably my favorite podcast, and that's not oh, uh, picking wow. favorites hey, or I'm, anything. I'm only, like, seven episodes in, so, so thank you. I, I don't feel like I'm on, like, comedy big, big level yet, but, but I do well, appreciate that. I don't know. Hearing your dad on there was pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, you guys have a nice dichotomy between each other that's really, really fun to listen to. I got a lot of great feedback on the episode of my dad. I definitely want to have him back soon. He was a fantastic guest. And then, obviously, having Lynette on was good as well. Yeah, I... I and thank you, by the way, for the shout out at the end of your podcast. That was really nice. I, I, I'm glad I could. I'm glad I could help out a little bit. I kind of want to encourage people to try out this forum because podcast because podcasting and doing radio has brought so much joy to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And obviously, you're being uh, a part of that the show for as long as you were, and you know, you touched a lot of people's lives maybe more than you realize. So it's cool to hear you in your own world being able to just open up to to the best parts of who you are, you know? Thank you, man. It's been, it's been a lot of fun for me, too. And, and for me, listening to you talk about your life was, was really... I, I thought that was really interesting, too. And to move on from you talking about your life to you talking about your, your comic collection, I did think the stuff about you talking about being a collector and how it's almost like a job, all, I mean, although it's a job where you lose money instead of getting money, but still how it's something that you had to put like daily, daily work into gave me an interesting look into that, that mindset. Yeah. And, um, funny you say that, like I got off work last night and the first thing I did was found my package of comics that had been delivered in the mail and literally spent an hour and a half organizing, sorting and putting them away. So it was, uh, is like a fun end to my night. I there guess. is something very satisfying about that. I I'm not a I'm not a comic guy. I but I have talked about my my Magic the Gathering card collection in the past, and I will say, yeah, if you open a few booster packs and you just you spend the night looking at each card, filing it into your you know my file cabinet by color. There, it sounds it sounds like wow, filing. How could that possibly be interesting? But it actually is like satisfying in a weird way. It, it, it's almost it's satisfying, and I don't know about if it was the same for you and Magic. I, uh, I used to do card collecting as well, um, more like uh, X Men card sets and stuff from mm -hmm. like you know the '90s and whatnot. But uh, for me, it's almost addictive to sit there and be like, okay, how do I how do I want to organize these to make it to where I know where everything is, you know? Oh yeah, no, there is something ad addicting about it, and then you organize it, and you're like, wait, how could I, you know? Uh, refine my organizational <laughs> yeah like how could i make that make it even more easy to find what i need and then it just you just spend more and more time on it the spiral downward right yes so when you think about your audience for this podcast do you think of it as being mostly comic book fans or non-comic book fans honestly i think it's going to be a little of both um you know i've had friends who i i work with and and otherwise listen and say oh wow that was like 
not expecting you to open up like that or I didn't know those things about you and I've been friends with you for 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to touch kind of a little bit of everybody as far as who I want to listen. But honestly, the listeners are just going to be up to who finds me. Right. Who? Yeah, whoever's just kind of around. I will... I will admit that being a non-comic book person myself, you know, I've seen a lot of comic book movies, but I've never been a book collector. I've never, I've never really dived into the comic books themselves. I will say that your discussion of, uh, like, your history of collecting books, there were moments where, where it kind of lost me, where I'm like, okay, I don't really know anything about the Marvel DC Universe and this specific Spider-Man collection, and I wonder if there is a way that you could make that kind of discussion more open to non-comic book fans, maybe describing more what's in each individual issue that you find interesting or what really makes it special to you or or whether it would be a good place to dive in if you're a non-comic fan. I'm not sure. Yeah, um, there are tons of awesome starting points. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a comic that like I didn't even talk about on the podcast that is only going to be 60 issues long, which mm -hmm. is really short for a book. You know, right? But uh, it's called Chew, like C H E W. Yeah, Chew, mm -hmm. and uh, it's about this guy, uh, this detective, who has the ability to, if he eats anything, whatever he's eaten, he instantaneously in his head sees where the thing he ate came from. So he starts solving murder crimes by eating part of the murder victim <laughs> and seeing. That is fucked up. It is absolutely fucked up, but, like, he sees how they died, and he goes, oh, well, now I know who killed him, you know? And it's, uh, it's a super short book. Uh, it's a great starting point for somebody who's never read any comics because uh, it's kind of got a little bit of comedy, um, some mischief in there, and then it's, it's overall really well written. Yeah, I don't think you could have, like, a bizarre high-concept premise like that that wouldn't have to have some comic angles in it. Of like, yeah. oh, no, I've got to eat, eat another corpse. Crap. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's quite funny. So you started talking about Doctor Who after that. And you were t I've never I've never watched Doctor Who. I was going to I was as soon as you started talking about who Doctor Who I'm like, "Oh god, you're another Doctor Who fan because I feel surrounded on all sides by people who are like this show is amazing and I'm like I don't I do not see it i can't see the appeal but then you started talking about enter the void and how my own recommendation of something you didn't think you would like made, made you find an awesome movie and it really is an awesome movie that's an amazing movie but Man, that it, it, was the trippiest thing i've ever watched it's un unlike any other movie i've ever seen gasper noe is uh yeah he's a visionary yeah it was uh you know like i said when you and mayhem were talking about it in my head i'm going what's so messed up about this movie i just i don't know if you could get like very creative, I guess. Right. It t it takes a while for for you to realize what's what's happening, but once and, you, once it gets and there, it's like once the bathroom scene happens and you start to understand exactly what point of view the movie's going to take. You're just like, this could get really interesting really fast. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> a head trip. But uh, so that made me think I'm probably being too judgmental of a show that a lot of people really love, and I've never seen an episode of. So. Again, there, that's actually a place where I would ask, being somebody who's had a knee-jerk hate reaction to Doctor Who my entire life, if you were going to recommend one episode that I should start with, I might, I might just watch it. Okay, I, I, I give you're going to want to go to season three of, of modern Doctor Who, not classic. Cause because, there are yeah, because it dates back like decades, right? Uh, 1963, man, long right. time. Um, but you'll go to season three of the current era and look for an episode called Blink. Um, now, Blink does not heavily feature the Doctor, but the villain in the episode is amazing, and the idea behind the episode is, uh, it's just ridiculous, like, in the best way possible. It actually has a lot to do with, uh, some quantum physics ideas that, uh, exist in the world. Oh, interesting. Yeah, very true. I, okay, I will watch that. I will watch that. You, you guys, podcast listeners can hold me to it. I will, and I'll talk about my Doctor Who experience on a future episode. That sounds exciting, actually. I'm excited to hear that. That I think that basically, after that, you you know, you talked a little bit about, yeah, uh, my podcast, Inspiring You, which, once again, thank you very much. That's awesome. And then you kind of ended on a philosophical note, which I thought was a really cool, interesting touch. Yeah, um, it's just people need to know what they are. You know, everybody has a role in life, and if you don't know how to accept what you are or who you are, 
then you're just going to roam aimlessly and accomplish nothing. Yeah, man, self-discovery. That's that's kind of like the whole purpose of life. And it's a, it's a ongoing, never-ending process. You always you could always discover something new about yourself. If you don't learn something new every day, you're not doing something right, you know. Right, man, that's living. Uh so I think there we go. Thank you for being the first person ever to submit a podcast to my podcast so I can do my podcast to be a podcast. How many times can I say the word podcast in one sentence and trying to break the record? But Nate, thank you for your submission. Thank you for uh, and thank you for talking about making a podcast of me. Okay, we're back. Uh, so that was Josh Figures It Out. That was my interview from 2014 with Josh, plus Josh Figures It Out, featuring Journey into Comics and crowdsourcing his song and a whole bunch of different stuff in the episode there. It's a great listen back. I'm a dude who likes brews. It's time for Brews with Dudes. Ah, juicy. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Brews with Dudes. I'm Nick, a dude, and uh, I've got some brews with me today, as well as dudes. First time, uh, we've got a first timer for the show today, Mr. Dave Linder. Dave, you want to say hi? How's it going, everyone? Good to be here. It's good to be next to you. Um, I believe we've got a couple couple veterans here too. I think it's been a couple times since Zach's been here. So Zach, how how are you doing? I am great. Thanks for having me again. It's good to have you. Uh Austin, welcome back. Yo, what's up? And Brett. I am back as well. So we're ready gonna to, uh, ready to drink some brews. We're gonna do we're gonna do the same old song and dance. Thank you for joining us. Uh the first beer that we've got today, who brought this bad boy? Uh that would be me, Austin. Welcome. Once again, if you wanna you wanna tell us what the hell we're drinking, well, Brett, you pass them out. What do we got this here? This is a uh, brew by uh, Golden Road Breweries. It's a Palisades Pineapple. It's a American wheat ale with pineapple and apricot. It's uh, made out in Los Angeles, California. It's a very tasty. It is tasty. Very, very fruity. Tasty. It is. The can the can looks like what you would find in those horribly painted California houses. <laughs> it's very true. It's uh, you, I can see my finger through the beer, but you can't tell it's a finger. It's not that clear, but it is a pretty, it's pretty light. Oh, very yellowy, crisp. very crisp. How how juicy is it, Nick? I'm gonna give it a solid seven on the juice scale. It is quite juicy. I think it's a little it's it's sweet. Aromas. It's very sweet. It's got a sweet very flavor sweet. to it. That's a apricot right there at the tail end. What's so. the? It's an apricot. Of course it is. That's that's the sour that I got for today. Um, it's really tasty. What was the ABV on it, Austin? It's got a four point eight ABV. And the IBAs I have. No luck finding on this. It's not better at all. Nope. No, not at all. Nope. I bet you it's zero. I, I bet it would be <laughs> closer to the uh, 20 range. I'm digging it. I am too. I'm too. Easily drinkable. I'm. I'm probably about done with this. I'm ready to. I'm ready to get something different on the palate. Oh. Very smooth. <sighs> I could drink several. I could sit down and just drink this. Me too. On my really? front porch. I would say a good springtime beer. I would agree with that. Definitely something you could uh, drink on the beach. Of California. Yeah. Oh. I, def I, I don't think it'd be my first pick coming up on the winter season, I guess. No, I like, I like a dark beer in yeah, the wintertime. Yeah, That's nice cold me, day. Nice dark beer. Yeah. I did choose this because last week it was all dark, heavy beers, and I felt like I wanted to bring something to lighten it up a little bit. Yeah, it was really. Was it last week that was really dark? Yeah. All, no, 
last time we did all, the all IPAs, remember? Yeah, all I, IPAs, all heavy beers. I guess, I guess that's, that's heavy as well. I was thinking darker. Oh, getting a little stout with it. Getting stout. Nothing that's what the cold. Stout. That's what the the cold months are for. We're gonna get into some dark beers. I know it. I hope so. How dark? How dark do you want to go? As dark oh, as my dark. soul. That's pretty dark. Real really dark. Still had your soul. Next beer. We're moving on to the next beer. We're moving right along. So, Dave, give everyone a, a little rundown. Do you what? What, what do you do with your life? Yeah. What I do with my life. Just uh, tell us something interesting. You don't have to tell us the mundane stuff. Unless you want to make it sound super cool. Well, I'm not very cool. But, um... Mainly, I just like to get naked on stage. My <laughs> goodness. What do you do for a living? What do you What do you mean? Are you a, are you a male dancer? I... You know, it, sometimes it'd be classified as that, yes. I like wow. to play the, the punk rock. And everyone knows that punk rock is better. So, before plays. you get on stage and dance for dollar bills, you put on punk rock music. You could say that. Do you work here in town? Sometimes. I go where the wind takes me. Does dancers do guy dancers? Or is it just females? They they should. They will now. Cause... Well, where do you work? Where do you do this? Where do you... I... Most of the time I do it here at the Doom Room. Oh, my God. <laughs> Good God. Well. Good Lord Almighty. I've Sprite. seen it, and Sprite I put my arms around him while he's done it. <laughs> yes, you have. Multiple times. So, I believe this is the one that I brought. This one's. Yes. Yes. This is the uh, Damascan Damascene from Tin Man Brewing Company. It's an apricot sour. Ooh. I like Tin Man. Tin Man has some good brews out there. Damascene apricot sour ale is a blend of traditionally soured ale and natural yes. apricot juice, with its aroma of tart fruit and hint of lactic acid bite. The only thing better is an apricot in Damascus. Tin Man, to put in a side note, is doing a beer school down at Knickerbocker next Thursday. Ooh, let's check that out. That is very sour. It is. I like it. I tend to like sour oh, beers, though. It's tart. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. Oh, that sour just makes everything so good. Right. I've never really been one for sours, so I don't know. It's it's different. It, they have to, to me. grow on you. When a couple, it was a couple weeks ago now. We went down to uh, 450 Brewery for the Corn Maze Festival that they had, and afterwards we drove over to Upland Brewery and went into their wood shop where they specifically make sour beers. So we just learned about that also at the brewing school. We did at the right. Knickerbocker. So we went there, and we got like two flights of 12 different sours, and you could taste the difference between them all. I think after that was when I was finally broken into it, because everyone I'd had just tasted like liquid warhead. If I yeah. may, you should try chewing it a little bit. Just get all I those do a little bit. I do a little bit. Uh, the only time I've really had a sour I liked is a bartender recommended doing a... Doing a half pint of Sam Adams Oktoberfest and a half sour mash and mixed it together. Mm. And that was really good. It gave it a really unique flavor. I got to say that, that liquid good. warhead description just brought me back to like sixth grade where you'd smash them and throw them in your soda or whatever it was. Yep. I did some fucked up shit to my teeth when I was young. But, I would but, put like Mountain Dew and cotton candy and just have this nasty mash and drink it. Yeah, yeah. Pretty fucked up shit. We would put we would we would get the uh, like Tostino's party pizzas. We get the cheese ones and we put M and M's on top of the party pizza. We lost me. And have chocolate pizzas. We were fucked up. We were fucked up little kids. You, you sound like a guy that would really enjoy a PB and J pizza. Mm. That does sound pretty that good. That sounds good, actually. I'd be about that. I don't know if I can run with that. I don't know. You don't need to run. You just sit with it. <laughs> you can't run after that. You just Peace enjoy. Lover. You just enjoy. Just enjoy. But uh, also with that liquid warhead description, that's not quite where I'd describe my uh, first experiences with sours. It was just more of a uh, really sharpness 
less sour, more sharp, and in exchange, in exchange of the bitterness that I would normally expect in a beer, and it was kind of always off until I found that one that just set me right. I remember the first time I had one, it was just so not what I was expecting. Because I'd never had a beer like that at all, and I just couldn't handle it. And then the next time I had it was the Skeleton Witch from Three Floyds. Oh, no. And it was good. It was great. It was great. That was probably my favorite sour beer. That, that, that one I actually really enjoyed just having the entire bomber to myself and slowly working through it because the flavors would just change throughout the whole bottle. Mm-hmm. And it was just a really good beer drinking experience. I gotta admit, I don't recall ever having a sour beer before. And I'm, it's pretty good. It's really different. Really different, but... Like, I give it a solid 7 or 8 out of 10. I'm digging it. It's definitely different. If I, uh... If I wanted a beer, I probably wouldn't drink it. Because it's not... It's it's so sweet that it's more like a it's, treat than it is a beer. It's, it's a very dessert beer. Yeah. It's, it like doesn't you, give the same kind of satisfaction that a beer does. You, you could sit down and eat like a chocolate amaretto pie and drink this and be perfectly fine. Yeah, that sounds pretty amazing. Mmm, pie. Is there pie? Can we... There's not pie. Oh. No. <laughs> not pies with these? We talked about adding salsa to the mix because we all like salsa so much. Yeah. Hot sauce. Hot sauce. Yeah. Just melt our faces off. Yes, we can. Okay, we're moving on to beer number three. We're having a bit of as dispute over as to what it is. As we're moving to it, I gotta ask Nick, where did you get this? Where do you think I got it? The Bedrock Liquors. Bedrock Liquors. Oof. I was there before they opened today, waiting. I was like, "What am I going to get?" Something special. I did I got that, and then. I got more Lord Hobo. Remember the Boom Sauce? Oh, that's good stuff. I got some more of it. Not the Boom Sauce. I got something else of theirs. Ooh, good. I'm excited to get into that. 